Many Christians today, when they think about Christian behavior, think in terms of a set of rules, that you're supposed to do these things and not do those things, and that you just have to grit your teeth and struggle to do it. And if you don't seem to be able to make it, well, you say, I guess I'm just failing on that one or whatever it is. That wasn't how Paul saw Christian ethics at all. For Paul, what mattered was the transformation of character. Now, Paul lived in a world where the philosophers had talked about the transformation of character for years. In Greece, where we are here, Plato and Aristotle and many other thinkers had talked about the virtues. They had seen that it's possible to think of a fully human character, a contented, happy, wise human being. And they had realized that just as you have to train your body if you're going to be a good athlete, or you have to train particular muscles and practices if you're going to be a musician, or you have to learn vocabulary if you're picking up a new language, so it is with character and behavior. There are certain skills you can practice which you can then put together and gradually you become the person that you wanted to become. Now there's a difference between that and what Paul and the other early Christians taught because for the ancient Greeks and the Romans, virtue was basically a solo sport. It was me making myself a better human being. And it was always about me striving to do better and to be better. Whereas for Paul and the early Christians, first it was always a team sport because at the heart of the Christian character were love and kindness and gentleness and things like that, which you can't basically do by yourself. You need to do them with other people. But also it was as though this idea of character formation had been taken out of one's own self-striving and had become part of God's gift by the gospel. But here's the strange thing which many people in our world find so difficult to get hold of. When Paul talks about the Holy Spirit and the work of the Spirit through the gospel, he talks about us becoming more human, not less, which means that our faculties are enhanced and we are enabled to think about what we do and to take choices which will actually transform our characters bit by bit. So that what we have in Paul and in the New Testament in general is a character transformation by the gospel and the spirit, which somehow enables us to make the right choices bit by bit, to learn the Christian character strengths, which are making us not into these lonely, proud individuals, such as you might have got from an Aristotelian virtue ethic, but rather to be wise, humble, kind, brave, loving people such as Paul is indicating again and again. So that, for instance, when he talks about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, many people today think, well, if the Spirit's going to do that in me, all I have to do is hang loose and let the Spirit do it. But the last one in that list gives the game away because self-control is by definition not something that just happens to you when you're just dozing. It's about you taking control of your own self, of your own character, of this process. And just as fruit grows on a tree, but if the gardener isn't careful, there'll be uh, predators, there'll be ivy, there'll be other things which will attack the tree, bad weather, whatever it is, and the gardener has to look after it and nourish it. So it is with the fruit of the Spirit. And this is how character develops. And for Paul, that character development always also includes suffering. People often say today, oh, if it doesn't come naturally, it can't be right. It's inauthentic. For Paul, no, it's always going to be a struggle. And the authenticity is what happens at the end of the process, not at the beginning. Perhaps the best example of all this is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which is a famous poem about love. Love is gentle and kind and so on. It's often read out at weddings. But towards the end of that passage, there's a fascinating little riff where Paul contrasts the way we are at present which, with the way where Paul contrasts the way we are at present with the way we will be one day in the future. He says, now I see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know even as also I am known. What has this got to do with love? The answer is, 
that he's thinking about the new creation. Love is the language that they speak in the new creation, and we get to learn and practice it now. Love is the song that they sing in the new creation, and we get to learn and to try to sing it now and to figure out the harmonies and all the rest of it. In other words, love is not simply a duty. It is our destiny. It's what we were made for. It's the very heart of our humanness, and we get to practice it now. That's how we can retrieve the ancient idea of virtue, although it is completely transformed because the gospel, by the work of the Spirit, enables us, by grace, to take the decisions through which we become the God-reflecting human beings that we were made to be in the first place. Yeah.